This presentation on why we process foods was part of a workshop conducted in St. Kitts and Nevis during February of 2016. Financial support for this workshop from the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, IECA, is gratefully acknowledged. I would personally like to thank Mr. Augustine Merchant, IECA representative in St. Kitts and Nevis, and the IECA staff for their considerable efforts in making this workshop possible. We will begin by looking at the question of why do we process foods. Then we'll examine some of the demographics, the population-related items that are important in the area of food processing. The next question is, how do we process foods, and what are the causes of food deterioration? We'll look at food preservation techniques and finish up with some summary comments. So just why do we process foods? One of the reasons is to match the supply with the demand in both space and time. And here we see a map of the world that will be the basis for our discussion. Spatial demands relate to location. For example, there may be a demand for food in the Sahara Desert area due to famine. There could be a source of food in North America, and getting it there is one of the problems. It's a spatially related problem and processing food can help us to meet these demands. Time demands tend to relate to seasonality. When it's winter in the northern hemisphere, there is very little fresh fruit available, so the demand lies in the northern hemisphere. But the source could be in the Caribbean. By processing foods or being able to transport foods through improved transportation techniques, we can align the source with the demand. Another reason we process foods is to improve such features as cleanliness. This is rather an obvious reason, so we'll move on to the next reason, and that's to improve edibility. Let's use a white potato as an example of this. When it is harvested, the starches in the white potato are not gelatinized, and as such are not digestible by humans. By cooking the food or processing the potato, we can gelatinize the starch and make it readily digestible. Third example of an improvement is safety. Here we see food hanging in the open on a hot summer day. By processing the food and storing it properly, we can not only prolong its shelf life, but we can also enhance its safety. And speaking of shelf life, this is one of the main reasons for processing foods. Looking at these fresh ripe tomatoes, we see something that's very appealing and highly marketable. However, in times of overabundance, tomatoes can rot in the field. Being able to process them into such things as tomato paste and tomato sauce would find a market for them. And of course, mangoes are important in relationship to this workshop and we don't want mangoes falling off the trees and rotting on the ground. We want to convert them into usable, value-added products, and processing offers that opportunity to us. Processing also provides variety, convenience, and diversity. Many people seek convenience, and here's an example of a highly convenient food. Here we see an example of dried noodles with a dried spice blend. By adding hot water and stirring, the net result is a quick, convenient hot meal that's ready to eat in the same container as it was packaged. We also want to accomplish these objectives while preserving quality. Now let's take a look at demographics. Demographics refers to population trends such as age distribution, gender distribution within age groups, geographical distribution of the population, disposable income, spending patterns, and a host of other things. So what are the impacts on meal preparation? Well, the population demographics that are available in both Canada and the United States point to some interesting conclusions. We can access these sources of information online. And here is an example of a report from Statistics Canada that gives population estimates by sex and age group as of July the 1st, 2013. 
Here we can see the population of Canada and the population distribution by age and gender from birth to 29 years of age in five-year increments. This tells us that at the time the population of Canada was approximately 35.1 million, of which just over 17.4 million were male and just over 17.7 million were female. Then we can see the age breakdown within each of these categories. We can focus on a particular age segment to gain insight into the marketing potential for products geared to males or females of this age. And here we see an example of the population distribution within the late teenage years for both males and females, with the population totaling about 2.1 or 2.2 million individuals. One of the more interesting population segments is the seniors who are over 65. This segment accounts for over 5.5 million in Canada, which is about 15% of the population. Aging populations have different dietary preferences or demands than younger segments of the population. Seniors may require smaller portion sizes, products that are packaged for single persons, reduced levels of spices and other ingredients, ease of preparation, easy opening package features, reclosable containers, plus a number of other specific features that may be relevant to this age group. There are certain impacts on meal preparation. One of the things is time impoverishment. The average Canadian no longer has a 9 to 5 workday, and they have a very busy lifestyle, so meal preparation must meet the demands that the consumer has. There are also single person households. There are potentially tremendous impacts on the future of food processing. Demographics provide information regarding the population trends, but the processor needs to understand the market, to be able to anticipate the demands, and to be able to respond to the changes that are necessary. This way they can be in a good position to address the future needs of the population. Changing consumer trends include conventional versus novel foods. Nowadays, people are accepting more of the novel foods and the marketing potential is quite large. There is also a desire to try ethnic versus traditional foods. And here we see an example of paneer, a type of cheese that is commonly produced in India. Information based on demographics can give processors a competitive edge over their competition. Food processing has to deliver to the consumer a diverse, high-quality food supply. Consumer pressures are forcing food processing methods to become increasingly more transparent. Free From is a current hot button that can be leveraged along with other established trends such as organic foods. And by Free From we mean such things as free from preservatives or meat that is free from growth hormones or various other things that the consumer considers to be undesirable. There are niche markets that can be identified through a knowledge of demographics. You can cater to the needs of a specific segment of the population, such as tourism with ecotourism, and cruise ships are constantly plying the waters of the Caribbean, bringing potential markets to you. Niche markets also include specialized export markets and special local and regional markets. There are indulgent consumers out there who are looking for niche products. These include gourmet cheeses, cosmetics from natural sources, specialty teas and coffees as shown here in this blend in the little dish at the bottom of the slide. And they want other things that are characteristic of this group of consumers. So how do we process food? It is done through the application of chemistry, microbiology, engineering, nutrition, and other disciplines of culinary arts. Causes of food deterioration include microorganisms. And here we see some mold growing on samples of a product that I was trying to dry. Pests include insects and rodents and a host of other things. 
Here we see a wasp sitting on a slice of mango that I was drying on an open-air dryer in the backyard one sunny day. So we have mold growth and insects as potential causes of food deterioration. Moisture is a big cause of food deterioration. Chemical reactions take place in the presence of water, as does microbial growth. So by eliminating water, we can reduce the rates of chemical reactions and the rates of microbial growth. Light is another cause of food deterioration. So let's take a look at the sun. The sun provides heat, and heat, of course, can degrade food. Energy from the sun can also be used to promote chemical reactions. These would be color changes. You only need to look as far as fabric that is in the sun and has changed color to realize just how powerful the rays of the sun are and the impact that they can have, while certainly the type of energy from the sun can cause deterioration of food products as well, and that can also induce flavor changes and other undesirable reactions to take place. Temperature is another major factor. On this thermometer we see that the temperature is 22 degrees. That's considered to be an ambient or room temperature. At those temperatures food will degrade at a certain rate. However, if we were to chill the food we could slow the deterioration, but if we were to warm the food from this temperature it would enhance the rate of deterioration. Oxygen makes up 20% of the atmosphere around us and is quite reactive. Oxygen can react with oils to produce such things as oxidative rancidity, or it can act with other compounds to cause off flavors and other forms of degradation. Enzymes are biological catalysts that are naturally present in some foods. Here we see a cauliflower that has been left out at room temperature and has turned a rather undesirable shade of brown or purple. This is due to the enzyme polyphenol oxidase, which has catalyzed a reaction within the previously white cauliflower to produce this enzymatic browning effect. Time, of course, is the number one cause of food deterioration. Shelf life as long as one year or more is quite possible with certain foods. There are also other causes of food deterioration that I have not gone into here. Some methods of food preservation include physical methods such as using high temperatures. They would be used in canning, aseptic packaging like drink boxes, and pasteurization which is commonly used to process milk. We have blanching which is the exposure of fruits and vegetables to boiling water for a given period of time which tends to denature the enzymes that are present and help prevent the degradative reactions that these enzymes can cause. The physical methods also include low temperatures such as refrigeration from 0 degrees Celsius to 4 degrees Celsius or freezing at temperatures below the freezing point of the product itself Typically, these would be something like minus 18 degrees Celsius. We can look at oxygen control. In a package of potato chips, for instance, or crisps if you prefer, oxygen that was present in the package was causing problems with oxidative rancidity by reacting with the oils in the potato chips. But manufacturers found that if they replaced the air in the package with nitrogen, these problems went away. Nitrogen, which makes up about 78% of the atmosphere around us, does not react with these oils and gives us a stable environment which prevents the occurrence of oxidative rancidity. Not only that, using nitrogen in the package also gives us a pillow pack or a cushioning influence that protects the chips from breakage. We can also use controlled atmosphere packaging to enhance the shelf life of lettuce and various other salad products. As mentioned previously, moisture or water is a key contributor of food deterioration. So by reducing the water content, we can enhance the shelf life. We can do this by concentration of liquid products or by drying of food products. And here we see plums which can be dehydrated to form prunes. 
the shelf life of these prunes is considerably longer than that of the plums. Modified atmosphere storage and packaging of things like apples is also possible to extend the shelf life. Typically, carbon dioxide levels are elevated to approximately 3% to prevent the degradation of apples during storage. Food irradiation is another one, but this is beyond the scope of our presentation here. Concentration through thermal applications can be used to reduce the water content of a product. Membrane technology can also be used to concentrate liquid beverages, and this little diagram down in the bottom corner simply shows some membrane cartridges which could be used to remove the water from such things as maple sap for the production of maple syrup, or even in juice manufacturing to concentrate the juice by removing some of the water by filtration at the molecular level. We can also freeze concentrate juices by lowering the temperature and at this point we will get the development of ice crystals which can be skimmed off of the juice mixture and that will increase the concentration of juice solids. By lowering the temperature some more we will form ice crystals which can again be removed and the process can be repeated in this manner. Osmotic dehydration is an example of where you can spread sugar on a fruit or vegetable sugar being hygroscopic will draw the moisture out of the fruit and create a syrup. This gives you an added benefit of getting a fruit syrup while removing moisture from the fruit itself. Dehydration or drying can be done by using forced heated air through a drying chamber. Here you see in the upper right of the photograph a lab scale dryer that I have been using in my research and here is a home food dehydrator that allows people to simply slice the food, place it on the trays, put the lid back on, adjust the temperature, and an internal fan directs heated air across the surface of the food that is to be dried. And you can dry things like apples in as little as 8 to 10 hours, and other fruits and vegetables in perhaps 15, 16 hours, or in the case of tomatoes, it may take quite a bit longer but these are very, very popular. I've also included solar drying here, and this is an example of a solar dryer that uses heat from the sun and some internal solar-powered fans to dry the product. Chemical methods of food preservation include water binding. Typically, an additive such as sugar will bind all of the water chemically that is present in the product and make it unavailable for the growth of microorganisms. This leads to what we call intermediate moisture foods. The moisture is there, but it is unavailable for the growth of microorganisms. We can also control pH or acidity. In this example, we see the pH meter reading a level of 3.73. This is below the threshold level for mold growth, which is pH 4. So by lowering the pH, that is, raising the acidity of a product, we can control the growth of microorganisms and prevent the spoilage from taking place. Chemical addition is also a method of preserving foods. Salt can be added to things like fish to remove the moisture and enhance the shelf life. Smoke will also aid in the preservation of foods, as will the addition of preservatives such as sodium benzoate or sodium metabisulfite and things of this type. There are biological ways of preserving food and these are predominantly through fermentations to produce cheese, yogurt and alcoholic beverages. Other processing techniques involve non-traditional applications such as high pressure processing or new technologies that are being developed to meet special needs. In this presentation, we have looked at various reasons for processing food products, as well as some of the ways in which the processing is done. These are in no way meant to constitute a complete list. They are only intended to serve as examples. You may have additional equally valid reasons for processing food products and other methods that can be employed. The important message is 
that food processors must be proactive in seeking opportunities. It is no longer sufficient to be reactive and wait to see what trends are coming along before taking any action in response to them. Following the pack with a Me Too product does not create a sense of uniqueness that will drive the demand for your product. Thank you very much.